Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to give a very basic introduction to causal inference uh, this morning uh, using the potential outcomes language. And I will talk a little bit about the uh, some of the basic statistical methods for causal inference in randomized studies as well as uh, observational studies. And finally, I will talk a little, about, a little bit about some graphical representations uh, of causal mechanisms. So all, this, all of these topics will be covered at a very basic level, right? So if you know much of this stuff already, <laughs> I apologize for, for this very basic introduction to cause the inference. So as I mentioned, there will be a basic introduction to cause the inference under the potential outcomes framework. And here are some of the references uh, that have been cited many times. Uh, so I will start with the definition of a causal effect, followed by randomized experiments, observational studies, and finally, uh, as I mentioned, some graphical representation of causal effects. Um, so, an acknowledgement, this tutorial borrows material from the causal inference book, as well as uh, lecture notes. Uh, previously used by these professors. Yes? Uh, yes, I think. It will be provided uh, by IMI, IMI, IMS, yes. Okay, so um, just to uh, motivate our discussion very uh, briefly, so suppose this girl likes to eat ice cream, right? But we also notice uh, an uh, association between eating ice cream and the number of deaths by drowning, okay? So, uh, of course, this is a classical association is not causation type of, uh, type of reasoning, but I feel that it's just a uh, very, uh, light-hearted way just to introduce our tutorial today. Okay. So, of course, we see now that um, there's this factor summer, the season, uh, which, is, uh, which is actually having an effect on the number of drowning instances, and it also has an effect on ice cream consumption, right? So, because of this confounding bias, we see a correlation between ice cream consumption and drowning, okay? So uh, the goal of causal inference is to really elucidate the causal mechanisms instead of uh, just association between any two factors, okay? Um, so another example is so these are the only pictures we are going to see <laughs> for, for the first part of this tutorial. Uh, so this, this example comes from uh, World War II. So uh, people are trying to study what will make the uh, mili military aircraft stronger, right, by looking at those that survived their missions and flew back. Um, but what reason that um, you shouldn't look at the damage on the aircrafts that actually survived the mission and flew back because those damages uh, are actually not so critical right, to, to, the, to the aircraft's uh, survival of the journey. So instead, we should reinforce the parts that haven't been damaged, right? on the aircrafts that managed to fly back after their, their missions. So this is an example of a selection bias because we are only observing the um, aircrafts that actually uh, managed to come back after the mission 
And so if we just base our conclusions uh, on these aircrafts, we might incur the so-called selection bias, right? So this is a very uh, well-known bias effect as well. So uh, hopefully uh, by the end of the tutorial, we will have some simple tools uh, not only to solve these, not only to understand these types of problems better under the potential outcomes framework, but also uh, know some basic statistical methods that will allow us to uh, estimate some of these causal effects. Uh, so uh, I will start with the uh, uh, some basic definitions first. So suppose you are contemplating taking an aspirin for your headache. All right, so, so we uh, assume a simple binary treatment variable, right? One is if you take it, and zero if you don't, okay? And then we have a, also a dichotomous outcome, uh, which denote whether you are headache-free within the next hour. Uh, one is cure of headache, and zero if your headache persists. Um, so as a thought experiment, you, might, you may think of two uh, potential outcome variables or counterfactuals, either of which may be observed depending, or not, depending on whether you take the aspirin or not. So these two are uh, sort of latent underlying variables that are waiting for you to uncover them, but you can only uncover one version of it. Okay? That's, so we have two variables here, right? So the, the little, the superscript zero means the headache outcome after not taking aspirin, right? And the superscript of one is the headache outcome after taking aspirin, okay? So we have these two potential outcome variables. Okay, so let's look at the uh, potential outcome for uh, two individuals. Let's say John, so his headache is cured when treated, but persists if left untreated. Okay, so, uh, so with the potential outcome little a equals to one, you are treated, so that out, uh, potential outcome variable equals to one. And if you didn't take aspirin, your potential outcome is zero, okay? So for John, clearly there's an effect of taking a causal effect, effect uh, on, the head, on his headache by taking aspirin. So for another individual, Jane, all right, her headache is cured with or without taking aspirin. All right, so in either case, her potential outcomes are of one. So uh, for Jane, we, f we think that taking aspirin has no effect because she's, she is going to be cured of her headache uh, no matter if she took the aspirin or not. Okay? So, uh, so one thing to emphasize is that these two, very, these po two potential outcomes are there already for each individual, okay? So we, we did not talk anything about treatment assignment or things like that. So these are latent variables for each individual, okay? We have not even talked about treatment assignment mechanism. Okay, so of course, uh, very intuitively, the definition of a causal effect Right, for an individual is if these two potential outcomes are not equal to each other, right? So if you took aspirin versus if you did not, and for these two potential outcomes, if they are different, then we say that uh, the treatment or taking aspirin will have an effect on you, right? And we, we did not talk about whether this effect is good or not. It just means there is a causal effect. So, of course, we conclude that for John, taking aspirin is a causal effect, but not for Jane. 
So uh, this uh, simple idea formalizes uh, using the potential outcome language. Uh, the usual saying, uh, what it means, right, for me to say aspirin has no causal effect on my headache outcome. So it is equivalent to a mathematical statement about my potential outcomes that they are equal to each other. So I could be cured of headache no matter if I take aspirin or not. Or I could be, my headache could persist no matter if I take the aspirin or not. So in either of these cases, uh, aspirin has no causal effect on my headache. Right? So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, this is a translation of the English sentence, aspirin has no cause if I have my headache, in terms of the potential outcomes language. Similarly, we can think of an individual with a beneficial causal effect of aspirin, right? So here, uh, the outcome is only dichotomous. So clearly, this means when you take aspirin, right, your potential outcome with super, superscript A equals to one, right, will be one, i.e. your headache is cured when you take aspirin, and if you do not take aspirin, your headache persists. And conversely, for someone, uh, for someone for which aspirin taking is harmful is the other uh, relation for these two potential outcomes. So, so clearly, we can only observe one of these two potential outcomes at any one time, right? Um, because we can only uncover one of these potential outcomes by the actual treatment that that person received. So, we, 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 so for example, John took the aspirin, and we can uncover the potential outcome for him when he took aspirin. Of course, we might think, well, why can't we uh, let John not take aspirin, for example, after a month, right? Um, and then we can decide if, he has, he, if his headache status then can be our potential outcome when he did not take aspirin. But then John will be a different person one month from now, right? So, uh, John could be, uh, could have uh, grown older, so many other variables change by then. So, so, um, so in that sense, we can only uncover one such potential outcome among the many uh, potential outcomes, uh, depending on the actual treatment that he or she receives, okay, for a fair comparison. Uh, of course, if you think that uh, as time passes, nothing changes, and you can say, well, I will measure his headache status one month from now, and I assume that his condition is exactly the same as his condition now when he takes aspirin, then that's another assumption you make, right? That his condition remains constant throughout this time. So we do not make this assumption here, so at any one time, we can actually only uncover one version of the potential outcome. Okay, so the fundamental assumption in causal inference links the observed data to the latent counterfactuals. So this is, uh, so if you have, if you took the aspirin, right, your actual observed outcome will be your potential outcome when you took the aspirin, right? Whereas if you did not, then this will be zero, and you are left with this version of the potential outcome. Okay? So this is the uh, this is a very useful equation to bear in mind. Okay, so if in the data sample you happen to be a person with A equals to one, then you observe that version of the potential outcome, right? and vice versa. So this is the consistency assumption, and the observed outcome is the counterfactual corresponding to the treatment that you indeed take. 
So the consistency assumption is implied by two assumptions, that the intervention is well-defined and there's only one version of the potential outcome, right? So you, you only have, you, you, your intervention needs to be well-defined, right, for us to know what A is in the first place. And secondly, a person's outcome is not influenced by another person's exposure or treatment. So notice in our earlier consistency equation, we did not take into account the treatment status for any other person, right? So these two conditions are collectively known as the stable unit treatment value assumption that is uh, frequently, uh, this assumption is frequently assumed in causal inference. And we can think of many situations in which they might be violated. For example, uh, for condition one, there may be variable levels of treatment, right? So the definition A equals to one may be ambiguous in the first place. Um, and violations of two are very common also. For example, uh, spillover effects, right? So especially in a community, um, if something has, for example, if other people are immunized against uh, a disease, then I will be conferred additional protection as well, right? Because of the protection of, uh, that has already been uh, offered to other people. So in, those, in that case, uh, the causal effect, right, might be influenced by the, state, the treatment status of other people in the community. Okay? But uh, for, for this introduction, we will just assume uh, the, these two conditions, right? Which, which will suffice, will be sufficient for most of our discussion. Yeah. Um, so it just means that when you say A equals to one, for example, then it is well-defined. There's no ambiguity in, for example, for John, his A equals to one means taking aspirin two pills, and then for Jane, her treatment A equals to one means taking one pill only. And that, that will be a violation of this assumption. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so in those scenarios, of course, now we are only looking at, uh, to motivate the discussion, we are only looking at a dichotomous treatment. Uh, of course, uh, the methods can be uh, applied to uh, polytomous treatment as well as continuous. Um, and I, Jonathan will be talking about a more advanced version that the treatment itself is time varying uh, over a course of time, a period of time. That will be an even more advanced version of my talk. So, uh, so yes, uh, that's. Just a very simple uh, assumption here that A can only take on values zero and one. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the variability is for each individual in the population, right? the treatment A equals to one, the potential outcome, and the treatment A equals to zero, um, the potential outcome under that, they might have individual in, uh, variability. So in that sense, uh, we, we think of the treatment as only being able to take on values zero and one for now. So the treatment itself cannot be variable. The potential outcome can vary, yes, among the individuals, yes. So that that will that will uh, put some random variability into the into the framework, yeah. So so uh, later I will just talk about the problem uh, under a finite population model first, and then before we complicate things with random sampling and things like that. 
So it will help make some ideas clearer. Of course, it will not be very uh, rigorous in that sense. And I will, of course, uh, I will, of course, make that very clear. Yeah, thank you. So the fundamental problem of causal inference is you only observe one of the two potential outcomes. So in effect, for each individual, you can never, uh, even in our simple case of only two versions of the treatment, we can never observe two potential outcomes for each individual at the same time, right? So again, this is what we have mentioned, right? We only uncover the potential outcome for the version of the treatment we actually took. Therefore, it is impossible to evaluate individual cause and effect. All right? So this is a missing data problem. And this is an extreme form of missing data problem because nobody has full data under this setting. Right? You have to be missing for at least one version of your potential. All right? So this is a very serious missing data problem. Ah, uh, yes. So so that will be, uh, that will, that's actually one of the methods to tackle this problem. Uh, but the assumption is the wash over part. The wash out, the wash out part will be, uh, sufficient, right? For you to, uh, make sure you are actually looking things for the same person. So that, that's an additional assumption. Yeah. So here we are sort of saying that, um, uh, we are, we are taking a very uh, sort of strict uh, uh, stand that we, we want that the, the two potential outcomes for that person like right now at the same time, yeah, which is impossible. <laughs> so this is the this is a missing data problem. Yeah. So of course, uh, although that is impossible, once we make addi additional assumptions we can attempt to uh, identify some of these causal effects. But, uh, so, uh, but we have to be very clear what are these uh, assumptions, and the potential outcome language can hopefully give us some tools right, for us to actually make these assumptions uh, clear to everyone. So now that we talk about the impossibility right, of identifying individual causal effect, we turn our attention to uh, another causal effect measure, the average causal effect in a population of individuals. So it helps to think of potential outcomes, as I mentioned, as being underlying pre-treatment latent variables that exist prior to the treatment assignment for each individual. So, um, and uh, as kindly pointed out, I. I'm going to ignore for now random errors from sampling variability, right? And non-deterministic counterfactuals, or both. So what do I mean by that? So we can think of everyone, for example, in this room, right? As these units in the un, and each one of you will have uh, two potential outcomes under each treatment. And uh, so now I will assume the outcome is uh, also binary, right? So we have these underlying potential outcomes for everyone, actually. And it's a pre-treatment variable, right? We did not uh, assign any treatment to anyone yet. Yeah, we are just born with uh, all these pot uh, potential outcome under two different treatments. And the goal is to uncover some properties uh, about these potential outcomes, even though we cannot man uh, we cannot identify uh, we cannot observe both of them at the same time for the same unit, right? But at the population level, we can try to identify that aggre aggregated causal effect. Okay, so uh, for example, we consider this population of twenty individuals. Uh, the outcome is. One is death and zero is survival. So notice that uh, this is a table about the potential outcomes. So in real life, we can never get such a table from a study, right? But uh, assuming that we, are, we know everything about the underlying population, 
So the, the second column, or this column, are all the potential outcomes if, right, you did not take the treatment for each person. So for, for, the, for example, for this person, if you did not take treatment, right, you will survive, and if you take treatment, you will die. Okay? And for some other people, the treatment has no effect. So this person will survive no matter what. Okay? So for each individual in the population, right, he or she has this pair of potential outcomes. Okay, so, so here I'm uh, using expectation uh, very loosely as uh, just the average, right, in this population of 20 individuals. So we can see that the expected value of this potential outcome, right, is just, because it's a dichotomous uh, variable, we will just, it's just the probability of this being one, right? So it's just 10 divided by 20. And then here, similarly, we take the uh, average of this variable, we will get 10 over 20 also, right? So e either case, we have 0 0.5, right? Okay. So the average causal effect in the population is an average causal effect of treatment A or outcome Y, right? So we say that the average causal effect is present if these two proportions are different from each other, right, in the population, in the population. So in the population, if we give the, if we do not provide treatment for everyone, right, for everyone, then half of them will survive and half of them will not. And if we treated everyone in this population, then also half of them will survive and half of them will not. So in effect, we say that at the population level, there's no average causal effect of the treatment. So when the average treatment effect in the population is now, the now hypothesis of no ATE is true. Right, so this is just another way of saying it. Okay, so n notice the absence of an average treatment effect does not imply absence of individual effect. Right? So clearly for each one in the individual, uh, in, in this population, right? so for example, the first person, the treatment actually has an effect on his outcome. But at the population level, there is no average treatment effect. So if we have the more stringent right, uh, condition that there is no causal effect for any individual in the population, i.e. for, every, for anyone it's either 0, 0 or 1, 1, then we say that the sharp causal now hypothesis is true. And clearly, the sharp causal now hypothesis implies the now average treatment effect hypothesis. If in the, at the individual level there's no treatment effect, of course there's no treatment effect at the population level. And we can represent the different average treatment effect using on different scales. For example, the risk difference, risk ratio, and the odds ratio. Right. So. Uh, so the choice of dif this different measure depends on the, your question of interest, right? So uh, the risk difference, for example, if you want an absolute measure of the risk reduction, then you can use the risk difference and so on. So note that, again, these causal measures concern properties of the underlying population even before looking at treatment assignment. Okay? So this is... Uh, property of the population itself, as of now. Okay. So in actual studies, we only observe values of Y and A. So in actual studies, we only observe the two columns on the right-hand side. Okay. 
In this population, we see that the treatment and the outcome are indeed associated because, again, the E here indicates a proportion, right? So if we only look at the person, persons where A equals to one, we know that there are seven of them with the outcome equals to one, right? And then, of course, if we look at the subset of individuals where A equals to zero, we get a different proportion. So in this population, the treatment and the outcome are associated, actually. Although we know that the average treatment effect is zero or now for this population. So this is an instance, of course, uh, the idea that association is not causation. Right? Association is not causation. So, so there are some intrinsic differences between causation and association. So note that when we compute the causal measures, we are looking at the potential outcome for everyone in the population, not restricted to any subset of individuals. So it's a contrast of two um, quantities for everyone in the population. Whereas if we compute the association measure, notice that we are looking at subsets of the population, right? For example, here, we only look at the outcome for people with treatment, and we only look at the outcome for people without treatment. So, so uh, fundamentally, these are two different measures. Uh, one, the causation measure actually pertains to, it, it is uh, at a population level, right? But for association, uh, we look at the subsets of individuals defined by their treatment status. And as we will see later, how we assign this treatment will be very important for us to infer causal effects. Because let's say the treatment assignment is such that we only, uh, such that the, uh, for those people with treatment A equals to one, for example, this group of people, uh, the potential outcome uh, distribution might be different from the group of individuals they are not assigned treatment. And so, because of that, we get an association, although at a population level, we cause the effects now. Okay? So we, we can take a look at some of these examples later. Okay, so um, these quantities, right, are population quantities that are computed by taking average among all individuals in the population. So this estimate is well defined even before we make any assignment of treatment. Right? Notice that um, for the first table, we do not have the uh, variable A, right? We just have their underlying potential outcomes. So this is to be contrasted with the, uh, this conditional expectation, which is only defined post-selection since the treatment must be well defined. Furthermore, this ex conditional expectation is computed by taking an average of observed outcomes only in a subset of the population where the treatment assignment is little a. Right? So this is there's a fundamental difference between uh, causation and association. Uh, but of course, back to the real world, we only observe the data outcome and the assignment for each individual. We can never hope to uh, observe both potential outcome without stringent assumptions. This can be, in principle, achieved through randomized experiments. So note that causal measures such as the risk difference can be written as a difference of two marginal means, which can be identified without requir requiring the joint distribution for the counterfactuals. And I will illustrate using an example how we can do it. So back to our aspirin example. Um, 
So we can compute the average treatment effect. Right? So either we take the average of this column minus the average of this column, or we can just take the difference first and then take the average. Right? So it's the same. Okay, here the average treatment effect on the risk difference scale is minus a quarter. So taking aspirin actually worsens headache for this group. Okay, suppose we randomize our population of patients with a headache to either aspirin or no aspirin with equal probability. Okay, so for example, we just flip a coin and we assign the treatment status for each individual. Okay, so in the real world, we only observe the columns A and Y, right, A and Y. So based on the observed data, if we compute the, this association measure, right, so for example, A equals to one, we, we, we calculate that there's only one person with Y equals to one, so it's one quarter and minus half, we get minus quarter. So in this population, the association appears to coincide with the average treatment effect. So why is this so? Okay. So this is because under this treatment assignment, these two quantities are the same. So for example, uh, if we only look at those assigned to be uh, A equals to one, for example, these four individuals, all right? So Notice that they have, uh, under this potential outcome, right, you have, uh, you have two, two of this equals to one, and for A equals to zero, for these four individuals, you also have two of this equals to one. Okay? So in, in other words, because the, tr the treatment assignment is randomized, so it is independent of, this, of the values for this column and the values for this column, right? So under this treatment assignment, we have this equality for either versions of the treatment, right? So this A will be sort of, I'm using my words very loosely here, so independent of the values of y1 and independent of the values of y0, right? Because A is randomized. Randomized with respect to the population. So, and because potential outcomes are underlying latent variables, so when we randomize our treatment, it will be independent of these underlying latent variables. So in other words, the treated and the untreated groups are exchangeable. And we sometimes say that the treatment is exogenous in this case. Okay, so, um, so to generalize this observation, we have this exchangeability assumption under randomized treatment. That is, uh, your treatment assignment is independent of the potential outcome, either version of the potential outcome for everyone in the so at the population level, we say that these two, this independence holds. Okay. Also, recall that we have our consistency assumption that we mentioned at the very start, right? So which version of the potential outcome you uncover depends on the assigned treatment itself. So the exchangeability assumption formalizes our intuition that since treatment is determined by, say, a coin flip, it should be completely independent of the individual's pre-treatment characteristics, such as their potential outcomes. However, the exchangeability assumption does not imply that your actual outcome Y is independent of A, since by the consistency assumption, the outcome is determined by the treatment A, right? Which ver so, so clearly Y depends on A, 
under this equation, and therefore it is a post-treatment variable. In fact, the actual outcome Y is independent of A, if and only if the sharp now hypothesis holds for everyone in the population. Okay, so now that we have these two assumptions, uh, of course we motivated these assumptions from uh, from a finite population example, and we jump right back to uh, uh, the sort of uh, assuming we have an infinite population. So if the exchangeability and consistent assumption, assumptions hold, then, okay, so this is the causal effect that we are interested in estimating, right, for everyone. Uh, for for a certain population. So under the, sorry, this should be the exchangeability assumption. So I was writing it as the randomization assumption. But this should be the exchangeability assumption. We have that these potential outcomes are independent of treatment assignment A, right? So of course, by independence, this expectation is equal to this expectation. Right, but just by independence. And because we are conditioning on A equals to one, of course by consistency, this potential outcome is actually the observed outcome for those people with the treatment A equals to one, right, by the consistency assumption. So, uh, so therefore, under randomization, your association measure here is the on a additive scale, right? Is actually the causal effect that you want, okay? Under randomization, so this provides a formal justification for using randomized studies to assess the effect of interventions, right? Using the potential outcomes language that we have uh, just briefly introduced. Of course, uh, there could be, there can be uh, uh, more complicated situations in which the randomization is conditional on certain values of your baseline covariates. Right? For example, uh, we randomize treatment for the females group only, and we, ran and we randomize treatment for the male group only. Right? Condition, condition on the gender. And we can have many different, uh, we can have a whole vector of such covariates. So, of course, the, the uh, natural extension is conditional on values of L, the potential outcomes are independent of your treatment assignment. Right? So this is the conditional exchangeability assumption. So for under the conditional exchangeability assumption, um, we can of course derive the G formula of Robbins or the so the, the so-called intervention formula for per by per. So uh, this is just uh, this is just computing the marginal by summing up this joint, right? So uh, assume here we are still uh, and then the the uh, under the conditional exchangeability assumption, so conditional on L values of L, the potential outcome is independent of your treatment assignment. So we can write it this way, right? Because now we are conditioning on L, so these two expectations are the same. And finally, by the consistency assumption, for this group, they actually receive little a treatment. So their observed outcome is actually the underlying potential outcome. Okay? So, so we arrive at this formula, which only have, which only has observed, which we can compute using only the observed data, right, to identify this param, this quantity. 
so there, there are no more uh, potential outcomes variable inside this formula. Okay, so this is the G formula or intervention formula. And uh, one, so notice that the computation of this quantity depends on distribution of the covariate in your population of interest. So for different populations in which the covariate distributions are different, they will have different uh, causal effect measures uh, under the conditional randomization, uh, conditional exchangeability assumption. So in epidemiology, this is referred to as direct standardization, whereby the conditional mean is average over the distribution of baseline covariates in the population. So this representation makes it clear that it depends on the inclusion exclusion criteria used to define the study population, right? Because of the dependence on the distribution of the baseline covariates. So for example, two studies with different inclusion criteria will generally yield two different causal effects. So for example, a, a drug trial that excludes participants with CD4 count greater than 500 versus one that excludes participants with CD4 count greater than 350. Okay. So, um, so, it, so if we use the G formula for this population, then we can never get values of CD4 count uh, greater than 500. All right. So the computation of the causal effect will be different versus another trial that have a different inclusion criteria. Okay. And this is, uh, this is uh, intuitive because uh, the same version of the treatment, depending on your population of interest, might have a different population level cause and effect, depending on the characteristics of the uh, population itself. Okay. Um, so this is this slide will be uh, just showing the equivalence of inverse probability weighting and standardization. So inverse probability weighting is another very commonly used uh, method to elucidate causal parameters, and I will just uh, I will just uh, briefly go through it. So as you can see, if you take this. IP weighted outcome and just take the iterator expectation. It will just, this, this uh, propensity score will just be canceled and then we are left with the uh, G formula. So this is the, so this inverse probability weighting and standardization are equivalent to each other under certain assumptions. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so that will conclude our discussion on, uh, randomized studies. Of course, there's looking at it, uh, in a very preliminary way, uh, as a simple introduction. There are many other topics that, that, uh, will be of interest and, uh, I'm looking forward actually myself to the many tutorials that are coming up uh, later, later these few weeks. So for observational st studies, of course, the exposure, treatment, or intervention is not randomized usually. So for example, in an observational clinical study, the individuals may be selected to take the active treatment based on their underlying health condition, right? So for example, if the doctors are more likely to prescribe a certain therapy to patients with certain uh, pre-existing clinical characteristics. So in this case, in this example, right, um, the patients who are more immunocompromised may be more likely to receive the drug than the healthier patients. So if we just look at a crude comparison of the treated and untreated participants, it will most likely indicate a harmful effect of the therapy itself. 
So in contrast, an analysis that adjusts for CD4 count is more likely to provide a more reasonable answer. So this is the main distinction between comparisons drawn from clinical uh, randomized trials versus observational studies. So notice in randomized trials, the treatment assignment is under our control, right? So we actually know even those, even though, even for conditional randomization, we know that conditional on uh, a list of covariates, we randomize. But for observational studies, we do not have such luxury, right? We must attempt to understand what risk factors of the outcome influence the treatment decision. Uh, such factors are typically also predictive of the outcome and, and could create an association between treatment and outcome when in truth there is none. So these ideas can be formalized using the potential outcome language. So um, causal inference from observational, start, uh, observational data, right? at least uh, for now, we think that it revolves around the hope that the observational study can be viewed as a conditional randomized experiment. Okay. Um, so the, the main idea is we try to use the tools from randomized experiment to investigate observational data. Right. So, so this is known as, so the combination of exchangeability and positivity are known as weak inerability. So I, I forgot to mention the positivity assumption is the conditional probability of receiving every value of treatment is greater than zero, right? Because um, if we don't observe any person, right, say for a given value of the treatment, then there's no way we can estimate these causal parameters. So this is an assumption uh, for us for, for, for identification and estimation. So in the context of observational studies, we have the no unobserved confounding assumption that is conditional on a certain list of covariates. The potential outcomes are independent of the treatment, of the treatment. So notice here, the, we do not know what these uh, covariates are, unlike in a randomized study but we make a similar assumption in an attempt to, um, to uh, identify the causal effect from observational data. So notice that this assumption of cause may be very wrong, but the fact that we can encode this assumption using the potential outcome language allows us to actually know the assumptions that underlies the methods that we use. And this is already a big step forward. So the circumstances for the study, so these are some situations in which uh, we might think the, this assumption hold. Circumstances for the study were chosen so that the treatment seems uh, haphazard or at least not obviously related to the potential outcome. For example, some natural or Quasi experiments. Uh, there's objective evidence that treatment assignment was a function of known observed pre treatment covariates, for example, some administrative rules. So, as, before, as stated before, the intuition is similar to that of uh, conditional exchangeability in randomized studies. But now, the randomization probability is allowed to depend on L in a manner designed by nature or by the underlying causal mechanism in the observational study and not under our control. So we do not know uh, which covariate actually uh, will be sufficient, right, as, as L, unlike in a randomized trial in which 
we, by design, by our own design, we know which are these covariates. So, um, so of course, this formula is exactly the same because the conditional exchangeability assumption and the no unmeasured confounding assumption, they are the same, right? So this is the same G formula previously derived in the context of a randomized trial. So, uh, so this is just a simple example that I will be skipping. Uh, just a simple calculation. And uh, so these slides will be made available, and this is just some exercise to uh, illustrate some of the quantities that you can compute under this assumption. Okay, so I will uh, stop here for everyone to take a break, and when we come back, we will talk about uh, another representation of causal effect using graphs. And at the end of the tutorial, I will talk a little, very, very briefly on some new tools that have been developed that unifies the graphical approach and the uh, potential outcomes approach that we just discussed. Thank you.